Thanks for Self Learned India discussions and dialogues for human innovations. Today's talk will be on wastewater management for the 21st century. And um, Siddhi tries to you know, bring various stakeholders uh, in conversation and dialogue to solve vexatious problems that have been plaguing India and the world for quite some time. Uh, so the aim of the Siddhi is to provide platform for discussing socially relevant technologies by bringing together academia, industry, experts, policymakers, government officials, NGOs, social entrepreneurs, students, think tanks, and the general public. Uh, I welcome Professor Indumati, who is actually from the Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, part of the Environment Group. Um, and uh, she was instrumental in bringing Professor George Shobunoglu and uh, Dr. Harold Leverance of um, uh, University of California, Davis. Professor George Shobunoglu is actually a legend in the field of, field of wastewater management. And um, now I hand over uh, the mic to Professor Indu. Before that, I would request, uh, Professor Indu is the moderator for today's talk. And I would actually request Professor Raghunathan Rengaswamy, who is the Dean of Global Engagement at IIT Madras, to say a few words of welcome and about Siddhi. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sudarshan. Uh, we started the Siddhi webinar series about a month or so back, and we have had several very, very exciting uh, webinars in this series. And today I'm really happy uh, to see such a distinguished uh, uh, panel. Uh, talking about wastewater management. Uh, so let me uh, quickly talk about Indu and Indu you can take over. Indu is uh, faculty in the civil engineering department. And of course, she also re leads this uh, CZC, Carbon Zero Challenge, which has become a huge uh, activity in itself. I, I know how much she has uh, worked towards uh, taking it to the levels that it is right now. And I'm really happy that um, she has been able to get Professor Jars to talk to us and talk to us about this important area. So without much ado, I'll um, ask uh, Indu to take uh, take over and then conduct the webinar. Thanks, Indu. Thank you, Raghu and Sudarshan. I'm very happy to host, uh, be a moderator and host this webinar. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor George T, uh, who is very well known among the environmental engineering community. I think there is some disturbance. Uh, can we have the mics off? Yeah. So Professor George and Harold uh, are uh, visiting faculty through Spark uh, in IIT Madras. Harold has already visited us. Uh, and George and Harold will be coming back again to IIT Madras when you can all interact with them personally. So a brief introduction to Professor George, although most of us here know about him. Professor George T. received a BS in Civil Engineering from University of the Pacific and MS in Sanitary Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. PhD in Environmental Engineering from Stanford University. For over 35 years, Professor George taught courses in water and wastewater treatment and solid waste management at the University of California at Davis, where he is currently Professor Emeritus in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He has authored and co-authored 600 publications, which is uh, including 23 textbooks and eight reference books. He has also presented more than 625 lectures on various environmental engineering topics, so he's a pioneer in the con constructed wetland technology and UV or disinfection technology, which has now become very common across the world, particularly in developing countries. In, uh, he has been honored with uh, several awards. In 2004, he was inducted into the US National Academy of Engineering. In 2005, he received honorary doctor of engineering from Colorado School of Mines. He is a corresponding member of the Academy of Athens and a member of European Academy of Sciences and Arts. His principal hobby is photography, and he has taken most of the pictures uh, that he has taken to his textbooks, which we have all seen. Harold Leverance is an environmental engineer with experience conducting studies in water use, resource recovery from waste streams. His recent work has included the development and testing of novel water wastewater treatment processes such as nutrient recovery from urine and digestate. This is actually the project which brought us together. 
and he has also worked with anaerobic bioreactors, closed loop water reuse systems, and anoxic treatment wetlands. Harold received his BS Biosystems Engineering from Michigan State University and MS and PhD in Environmental Engineering from UC Davis. Currently, Harold is a project engineer at UC Davis and is a licensed engineer in California. Without much ado, I would uh, request George to start his webinar, which is a very important topic. Uh, some things which uh, normally we miss in conventional wastewater treatment design and operation. So he's bringing to us some of those missed concepts, which are very, very relevant to the 21st century and more importantly, uh, in current times. Over to you, George. Thank you. It's, a, it's my pleasure to be here with you. As I was telling Indu earlier, uh, I haven't put a tie on in nine months. And so if you can see me, I actually do have a tie on. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. And the topic today is really wastewater management in the 21st century. And what we want, what I want to do Move to your slides. Just open your uh, laptop and then press the share screen, Professor. Yes, sir. We can see your presentation now. You're all okay. there. It, it doesn't go down here. I think we are, we are fine. Yes. Which one? You just click on the button. Okay. So for our discussion uh, this evening, what I'd like to do, this one, right? It was on before that. Just open it and press the share screen. Okay, one second. Yes. We can see your all set. Can you see that? Can everyone see the screen? Yes. 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 All right. So. In our discussion this evening, what I'd like to do is after a couple of introductory slides, I'd like to really focus on the 21st century challenges faced uh, in the field of wastewater management. And then I'd like to look at some future opportunities. Uh, those are the opportunities that you will participate in and bring about. So what is environmental engineering? Well, it's all of the items listed here. And today's presentation really focuses only on wastewater management, but it encompasses the items listed and many other topics that people include. It won't come down. Not advancing. We're having some this is the same one. Ah, oh, there we go. Which is the arrow keys. All right. So the first, the second thing we want to introduce so that everyone has a, an understanding is what is wastewater treatment? And the slide I have shown on the left hand side, lower left hand side, wastewater contains a variety of constituents, coarse solids, suspended solids, inorganic. Uh, pathogenic organisms. And the role of wastewater treatment really is to remove these constituents of concern so that the water can either be discharged to a receiving water or used for some other purposes. And the way we do that is by putting together a series of processes, each of which is designed to achieve a certain uh, objective. For example, in preliminary treatment, we remove heavy solids that settle by gravity. Primary treatment, uh, additional removal. 
biological treatment, we convert organic matter into cell tissue, which can then settle and be removed. So the idea here is that we put together the processes that are necessary to produce, remove the constituents of concern. So what are the 21st century challenges? Well, I, there are many, but I'd like to deal with three. The first one is we are going to have to deal with unintended consequences of past decisions. And in all of your work, all of you will face this particular problem. Secondly, we got to bring about a paradigm shift to move beyond ideas that are limiting or no longer valid. And then finally, we need to talk about integrating water and wastewater management. So let me start by looking at uh, the impact of the law of unintended consequences. And the first thing I'd like to consider is urban sprawl. So if we look at the, this particular slide in the upper left-hand side, you see the city of Sacramento and its wastewater treatment plant. On the lower right-hand side, the city of Los Angeles, the wastewater treatment plant, Hyperion. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, when both of these plants were put in, there was not a single home anywhere near the wastewater treatment plant. It was never anticipated ever that these areas would develop. But in point of fact, they have. And so what is the problem here? If we wanna reuse the water from either of these two locations, we have to pump it significantly and we have to put pipelines in that would disrupt residential areas. So it has become a very complex issue to recycle from existing wastewater treatment plants. And again, the unintended consequence is that no one thought there would ever be houses all around these treatment plants. Next, let's take a look at the impact of climate change and specifically sea level rise. And I want to do that by looking at two systems, the East Coast, New York, and San Francisco on the West Coast. In New York, on the upper left-hand side, uh, shows the boroughs of New York and the wastewater treatment plants. As you'll see, all of the wastewater treatment plants were located near water bodies so that there would be a ready uh, point to discharge the effluent. Further, when they were located, they were located in remote distances and it was assumed that there would never be any population growth. Well, as in the previous slide, the whole area has filled. A typical example of one of the treatment plants is shown in the lower left-hand corner. Now, what's the problem here? Well, if we look at the upper right-hand side, when the treatment plants were put in, the original channel had the V configuration that is shown. And there would be occasional hurricane surge flows, but the elevation would only rise as shown in the, uh, to a, a given level. And the plants were designed to uh, sustain that kind of rise. But what has happened in recent times is that we have far greater hurricane surge flows and far more often than we had in the past. At the same time, there's been infilling here throughout. And with this infilling, as a result, with the larger volume, the surface water elevation at the end, when the velocity goes to zero, uh, rises. And unfortunately, you see what happens. And this occurrence, this flooding of this wastewater treatment plant used to occur perhaps once every 10 years. Now it can occur three or four times during a single year. And as the hurricane surge flows are increasing, the magnitude is affecting. And so the problem here is an unintended consequence. No one ever anticipated that there would be these surge flows or this infill that would create the, pro the problem. And when you look at it in New York City, it's going to be 
very difficult to deal with this problem. And so one of the philosophical questions that has come up is, is it appropriate, must we learn to learn to live with a certain level of environmental pollution? We'll get back to that issue. Now, let's go to the West Coast, and this is the city of San Francisco. In the city of San Francisco, they have uh, constructed underground storage uh, bunkers for to receive all of the storm water. And you can see all around the city, all around the city are these storage areas. And they discharge and down here, but all around, and the idea is that all of the storm water is captured. Now, if you look at the cross section, we have the collection sewer, and then we have this transport and storage uh, basins. To deal with an extreme event, a very extreme event, they set the weir elevation here based on the best knowledge at the time. And so that's the discharge location. So if we look, this is the discharge location right here from one of these submerged tunnels. Now, what has actually happened? Well, the weir elevation is set at minus four. And look what's happening, look what's happening with the tides. And since 1950, the water levels, the tide levels have exceeded the elevation of the weir. So instead of water flowing out of the basin, water flows into the basin. Now, what kind of problems are caused? Well, you bring in seawater with high sulfate concentration and it mixes with all the oils and grease from the restaurants. And so if you walk along the Embarcadero in San Francisco, you will see vent pipes and they're venting all the hydrogen sulfide that's being produced. And so here again, an unintended consequence. What has happened now? They have had to raise the weir and they have had to install pumps to pump water out of these basins into the uh, receiving water. And again, an unintended consequence. No one ever thought the water would rise to this level. And with increasing uh, sea level rise, these events are occurring all of the time. Now, the next unintended consequence is I'd like to consider water conservation. And when we think about water conservation, uh, I'd like to start with the diagram over on the left-hand side. Basically, our population has remained constant, but if we look at the total flow rate, it has gone down. Now, R1 is pre-1992. and Around 1992, conservation measures started to be implemented. And as they've continued to be implemented, the flows have come down. The issue is we don't know where they're going to stabilize because there are still a lot of old appliances, for example, washing machines that have tubs that have 30 gallon capacity. We're now moving to seven gallons per uh, load. So again, the idea is that we started at a relatively high value, we're moving down, and you can see what the rates are. So what does this mean with respect to uh, concentrations of wastewater? And the, here we have data from the city of San Diego, and we have influent flow rates, BOD, and TSS. So if we look at the flow rate, the flow rate went from, in 2011, went from 16.5 MGD to 15.8 in 2016, and yet the population increased by 30%. But what's more significant is look at the BOD. In 2011, it was 251. Now in 2016, it's 326, and it has gone even higher. Now, what does this mean? 
In the past, wastewater treatment plants were designed on some average concentration. And the issue now is that there is no average concentration. And so what we really have to do is consider the waste discharge per person, and then ask ourselves, what volume of water is that waste placed in? And so here's an example. So if we look at constituents, BOD, chemical oxygen demand, total suspended solids, total Keldol nitrogen, potassium, oil, and grease. And the unit we're going to use is grams per capita per day. And as it works out now, we have fairly good data on what the typical values are. So if you put this, these grams into 100 gallons, 380 liters, the concentration comes out to be 199 milligrams per liter. And that's in the past what we would call a medium strength wastewater. But as the flow rate decreases to 190, the concentration is now 400. And so what we're finding as we go back and re-examine all of these existing treatment plants is that we're finding, we're finding incoming BOD values of 300 to 600 way beyond design capacity. And again, no one ever anticipated the effects. When we instituted water conservation, everyone felt good about saving the environment. But let's see what's actually happened. Here's an example of what's happened with respect to wastewater collection systems. When you flush a toilet with a low flush amount of water, you get solids deposition. Now the solids deposit and in time they become anaerobic and they will release hydrogen sulfide. The hydrogen sulfide is carried by skin friction down to reinforced concrete pipe and we're seeing increased rates of corrosion that we never anticipated before. And so in many parts of the Midwest in the United States, the rates of corrosion have increased by a factor of eight. Also, we're getting blockages. Now, both of these events were unintended consequences. When people started to use low flush devices, no one thought about the collection system. And yet, 80% of our infrastructure cost is tied up in the collection system. Here's an example of what happens in large collectors, grease accumulation. And the way grease accumulates is if there are irregularities in the wastewater collection system, they serve as nucleation sites for the formation and the buildup of grease. And these are extreme examples, but we're experiencing these kinds of blockages now in wastewater systems on a routine basis. And again, an unintended consequence. No one thought anything about it. Everyone felt that reducing water use and low flush devices would be beneficial for the environment. It is, but yet no consideration was given to the operation of the wastewater collection system. And in fact, if the flow rate drops much lower, the existing equations that we use for design are no longer operative. So there are a lot of issues here that we have to consider and that you folks are gonna to have to solve. At this point, let me stop and uh, turn it over to Indu and Harold and uh, we'll see if there are any questions or any discussion topics. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, George, uh, George, thank you for the first half of your presentation. It actually, uh, as you were talking, I was actually drawing parallels to Chennai city and uh, the US cities, particularly San Francisco. Uh, we have, uh, we are very closely, uh, mm, I would say in terms of problems, uh, San Francisco and Chennai share a lot, particularly uh, urban sprawl, uh, water shortages, groundwater withdrawals, uh, drought, 
um, I think we, uh, so there's a lot we could learn from uh, experiences in San Francisco. Um, so uh, the other issue I was having in mind uh, is when you talked about water conservation, it was a big eye opener when the impact of water conservation on the sewage networks. Um, and you also talked about the well, BOD. You can, answer for my, you can come and sit here. The DOD load is also increasing. The other load which is increasing uh, is the salt content. In, in India in particular, uh, we have gone ahead and implemented recycling, reuse within apartment communities, gated communities, industries. So apart from BOD load increase, uh, the TDS will also be increasing. So how many times can we ideally do this type of uh, recycling? Uh, beyond, at some point, it is going to have an impact on the treatment and maybe on the uh, pipelines also. And the TDS level starts going up. What are your thoughts on this? Maybe Harold can also join in. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Andrew said, um, these are the uh, everyone. So there is a lot of uh, we are finding a lot of uh, corrosion increasing in our collection systems, and these are studies that are underway right now. One thing we're working on is uh, updating wastewater collection systems because as the wastewater gets more concentrated, there's more uh, corrosion that occurs. And so we're in the process of optimizing collection systems to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and corrosion that's occurring to find a way because certainly in the future, we're gonna be using less water than we use now. So we have to find a way to keep our collection systems working properly, even in the context of uh, climate change and these natural disasters and reduce water use going into the future. Yeah, a, a related question uh, uh, on the first section of the talk from uh, Professor Korean Joseph uh, in from Anna University. Uh, he would like to know what is the uh, impact, potential impact of intense rainfall due to climate change or otherwise on the performance of constructed wetlands? Uh, Andrew, could you repeat the question, please? What is the potential impact of intense rainfall on the performance of constructed wetlands? You're wondering about the impact of intense rainfall on constructed wetlands. The one, of the, one of the problems we face with intense rainfall in constructed wetlands is washout. And washout has been a real uh, major, a major issue. And what people have done is uh, have uh, insta installed diversion structures so that the peak rainfall event is diverted. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but if you don't, it's very easy to wash out a wetland. And so again, an unintended consequence. These peak flows, and we'll we'll talk about it a bit later, are very significant, and they are going to affect affect every design that we do of wastewater treatment facilities. Okay. Uh, also, with respect to climate change, uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, questions. Will the temperature increase? reduce the DO content in the wastewater. So that's going to have add more energy cost to the wastewater treatment plants. What is your view on this, Dr. Josh? Well, uh, it also affects the conversion reactions that occur in a wastewater collection system. And uh, what's interesting with temperature is that if we think about potable reuse, we're now going to have to think about cooling the water before we supply it. So temperature has so many different effects. 
In terms of the kinetics of treatment, uh, the interactions that occur in a wastewater collection system, and uh, the other issue with, with temperature too is that while most grease are soluble at ambient temperature, as you increase the temperature, all of the grease becomes soluble. Now, what happens is that that transports into the biological treatment process and it coats the microorganisms and it affects the treatment kinetics. And so historically, if you look at wastewater treatment plants in, a, in old textbooks, they'll show grease removal facilities. And that worked perfectly when the grease we used was lard and lard solidified at room temperatures. And so it was easy to remove by skimming, but that is no longer the case. And so now we have to think about what happens with all of this grease that we have in the collection system. And as Harold pointed out, as the flows go down, it emulsifies because of turbulence. And again, it's carried over into the biological treatment process. Thank you. Um, coming back to the question of water conservation, rethinking water conservation and its uh, impact on the treatment plant. Uh, nowadays, there is an increased awareness about uh, uh, the threat, I would say, about the antimicrobial resistance and resistant genes, uh, which are escaping our wastewater treatment and going into our recycling uh, system. So what are your thoughts on uh, ARGs, antimicrobial resistant bacteria coming back into our households when we are using these recycled water for flushing or other uses? Well, I think that, um, that what happens is that uh, we're going to develop new methods of operating wastewater treatment plants. And as you do, we can optimize them for the removal of specific constituents. And I'll get to that. And uh, I think that with advanced treatment, and you'll see the processes I'll describe, uh, the, we have effective means of dealing with that at this time. But we can improve in terms of the operation of the biological treatment process. Harold, I've got this whole screen now. What's happened here? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, we can go back to your presentation and then come back with the Q&A at the end of the presentation. No, it's the same problem. Now, in the second and third parts, I'd like, you'll remember the second major concept was dealing with ideas that are limiting or no longer valid and uh, with respect to wastewater treatment. And this is an important subject matter. So the first thing I'd like to do is just consider single use of water. And these are large cities, and this is a little bit dated, but you can see all over the world, the single use of water will not be sustainable, is not sustainable, because what's happened is we have the same amount of water or less but many, many more people. And so we cannot continue with a single use of water. That is, we bring water from the interior, we treat it, and then discharge it to the environment. It will no longer, it's no longer sustainable now. And in the future, this problem will become ever uh, more critical. So the issue there is that single use of water really can no longer uh, be a design objective. So what about current effluent dispersal practice? So let's take a look at that. Uh, currently, as shown on the left-hand side, we have a municipality, there's a wastewater treatment plant, and from the wastewater treatment plant, there's some local reuse, and the rest is discharged to a river. And downstream, another community pumps out of the river, goes through a drink, drinking water treatment facility, and then into a municipality. 
And I would just like to highlight one of the problems here just for a second related to the fires in California. Now, we have always had fires and there were always hydrocarbons that came into the rivers from runoff, storm rainwater runoff. But what is new now is that when so many of these homes have burned and all this plastic material has burned, when we get runoff, all of that goes into the rivers. Unfortunately, our water treatment plants were never designed to remove those constituents. So that's one thing. But on the right-hand side, we have a map of the Sacramento River and, and the California water plant and the Colorado River. Over on the right-hand side, on the Colorado River, there are 256 discharges to the river. Now, here's what's interesting. If you go skiing in uh, Colorado, up here, you, and two weeks later, you're in San Diego and you drink the water, you've bonded with yourself. Look what happens here. All of these discharges discharge into the Sacramento River. Here's the California water plan that brings water to Los Angeles. In either of these cases, the communities are drinking varying amounts of secondary treated effluent. And the amount depends really on conditions. In some parts of the country, during drought conditions, it has gone up to about 75%. So when we talk about the downstream use of surface water as a source of drinking water, and which has been subject to wastewater discharge, we identify that as de facto indirect potable reuse. And it's going on all over the world. So again, these are our sort of current practices. Finally, I'd like, in this segment, I'd like to consider centralized versus decentralized treatment. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, we have conventional wastewater treatment infrastructure. And the idea is it's much like a tree. It comes down to a central trunk that is the wastewater treatment facility. What I believe has to happen for all major cities in the world is we're going to have to have satellite or decentralized treatment. And that is we're going to have to have upstream treatment and reuse. The concept is that we will be able to take this water, treat it and use it locally before it goes all the way down to the treatment plant. That way, we will not have to pump all the way back. Now, the best example of decentralized wastewater treatment is the city of Los Angeles and Los Angeles County. In the city of Los Angeles, this is the Tillman plant, Glendale plant. They are scalping plants. They pump out of the collection system, treat a constant flow, and discharge all of the solids to the collection system which goes down to the Hyperion, the plant I showed you in the first slide. So the idea is they've optimized treatment and the, by, optimi uh, by upstream treatment, they're able to reuse this water locally here and not have it transported all the way down here and then to transport it back up. A similar system is operated by the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. And in my judgment, this represents the future for the world in terms of better utilizing our water resources. So future opportunities, and here let's take a positive view about all this. And I'd like to start out with new treatment technologies. And the first one I'd like to consider is primary treatment. In the past, historically, we have used primary sedimentation. And we have developed filters now that we can use following primary sedimentation. And what happens here is that you reduce the light material that is not settled and you increase the, solid, the uh, solids that go to digestion to optimize gas production. The effluent then is much easier to treat. 
Now, a very interesting aspect of this effluent is that by filtering it, you alter the particle size distribution. And when you alter the particle size distribution, you alter treatment kinetics. And so we're now only be now beginning to explore what happens when you alter treatment kinetics. So the first one is known as primary effluent filtration. So if you have an existing uh, treatment plant with primary clarifiers, filters can be added. In the second case, primary filtration, we're going to use a cloth disc filter to replace the primary sedimentation tank altogether. So there is no longer a sedimentation tank. And again, the effluent from the filters is uh, very consistent and the particle size is very small because the nominal pore size of this filter material is five microns. Well, what does this mean with respect to treatment? This is a full-scale treatment plant, a 2MGD, and the unit shown in the circle here, which is depicted in the upper left-hand corner, replaces the whole primary concrete structure that you see here. So in other words, this tiny little box replaces this entire structure. Now that's going to be good and bad as we'll see in a moment. But you can see the uh, TSS coming in varies all over the place. The effluent quality is very stable and very predictable. Now, at the same time, we have developed new biological treatment processes that will reduce the size of the treatment facility to this little red square here. And this is our primary filtration in our little red square here. Now, and there are many processes that are gonna come and we're gonna be able to do this, but there are consequences in doing this because of the way our collection systems are built. Let me, let me go back and now let's consider climate change. Wet areas are getting wetter Dry areas are getting drier, but by far the greater concern is the intensity of the rainfall event. And you can see that in the lower right-hand slide. And basically here's the storm event, here's normal flow. It works out that our wastewater treatment plants are currently designed like bathtubs, water in, water out. They were never designed to deal with such peak events. And so all of you that are watching this, this is one of the major issues you're going to face. And that is, how do you deal with these peak stormwater events uh, and implement a very, very small treatment fa facility such as shown above? And this is going to be one of the challenges. In other words, technology has brought us to this level where we can take all of this facility and reduce it down to these two little units but on the other hand, we don't really, are, are not really able to treat these peak flows. Sorry about this slides. So here again, an unintended consequence. We reduce the size, but we still haven't dealt effectively with the stormwater event. And in your practice, all of you that are listening, this will be a major, major issue in the future as you think about implementing new technologies and how to deal with storm events and the flows, the corresponding flows. And again, remember, it's the intensity of the rainfall event. Uh, I'll just give you an example. When I was a graduate student at Stanford and we wanted to study storm events, we always used to contact our colleagues in India to get records of peak events. Now we can use Houston, Texas, 50 inches of rain in 24 hours. There is no treatment facility designed to deal with that. So again, an unintended consequence. Let's talk a little about potable reuse and potable reuse really represents kind of the last frontier. 
And when we think about potable reuse, there are two types. There is indirect potable reuse and direct potable reuse. In indirect potable reuse, we employ an environmental buffer before the water is actually reused. So as shown here, we have a wastewater treatment plant, we have an advanced wastewater treatment plant, and we have either spreading basins or injection wells. Here's a reservoir, injection wells, spreading basins, more spreading basins. So the water is injected and then it's withdrawn, treated again, perhaps, and then distributed. In direct potable reuse, we have, again, the advanced water treatment facility, but this time we supply water at the head end of a water treatment facility. It might be blended with other surface water and that's known as direct potable reuse. If the treatment, advanced water treatment facility is also permitted as a drinking water facility, we can then inject this water directly into the distribution system. But someone raised the question of temperature earlier. When you think about temperature, uh, this water is going to be very warm. So when you open your faucet, uh, you're not, a, in, at least, we're not accustomed to warm water. So we're gonna to have to cool it. So again, there are all of these consequences that we're going to have to think through. Now, when we talk about advanced treatment, uh, it has become very sophisticated. And here's the, the, perhaps the best example of all this is the Orange County Water Dist Treatment Facility in Orange County, California. And the flow diagram is shown. And the, one of the first things we have is flow equalization. And you can see the tanks in the upper left-hand corner. We then go through microfiltration shown in the middle photograph, upper photograph, and then cartridge filters. That's followed by reverse osmosis shown in the lower left-hand corner, advanced oxidation below it, decarbonation to remove the carbon dioxide, and the addition of lime to stabilize the treated effluent. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is when you look at cartridge filters and you ask yourself, if you go through submerged microfiltration, why do you need a cartridge filter? Well, we need cartridge filters because the chemicals that we add, the purity is not sufficient to avoid damaging the reverse osmosis membranes. So the cartridge filters are basically used as a pretreatment for the reverse osmosis. So this represents a fairly complete uh, treatment. And I would say at this point represents the state of the art. Now the effluent from this particular plant goes to these spreading basins and it goes to deep well injection, which serve as a seawall, uh, seawater intrusion barrier. So again, that's the, per uh, but this all water is also used as a public water supply. And currently, uh, the plant started at 80 million gallons per day, and the last expansion, which is currently being done, will take it to 130 million gallons per day. So I would say that this represents kind of the state of the art with respect to advanced wastewater treatment. So the last thing we want to talk about is integrated wastewater management, and that's the one water concept. And right now, when we, when we talk about water we, in municipalities, we have a wastewater agency and we have a water agency. And very often they're at odds with each other. But let's take a look at what the future might look like. In the one water approach, what we're saying is that all water, including drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, gray water, other waters, are treated collectively as a resource that must be managed holistically and sustainably. Now, the only way to do this is if we merge all of these individual departments, and in some communities, even the solid waste division should be merged, and into a single water entity that can, when it plans, can think about 
both the water side and the wastewater side and how to uh, integrate that. Now, let me give you an example. Here is, uh, Harold and I have talked about this. Here is our future city. And if we, what we start with, we have uh, on the upper, in the left-hand side, we have a satellite treatment facility. We have an advanced water treatment facility. And this can go to spreading basins or injection wells or surface water reservoirs or uh, Again, depending if it's permitted as a water treatment plant directly to the municipality. So upstream treatment. In addition, we have satellite interception type and extraction type satellite systems. All of these form a kind of water reuse picture. And so we're utilizing the water upstream. The downstream plant can provide removal of solids and other materials, but here the concept is we're gonna take water upstream and utilize it at those locations. And we're also going to extract water and intercept water. So what do those systems look like? Well, here's an, here's an extraction system. We have a collection system. We pump out screenings or discharge back to the flow. We have a biological treatment process, excess biological solids are discharged. Here's an example. This is the house shown right here on the corner. And when you ask people about this house, what do they say? Well, they have more money than us because it's a much larger house. Well, it works out, it's the wastewater treatment plant. It's been there for years. No one knows that it's there. And the idea is it extracts flow, treats it, discharges the screenings, waste activated sludge, and so you're only talking about treatment and this water goes to the golf course. Now in New York City, interception type systems are common. Now in interception type systems, the basic principle is we intercept the wastewater before it ever reaches the wastewater collection system. And so you can see in the diagram here that what we, ha what we have is, uh, a collection system and we capture the water and in a flow equalization, we treat it, excess waste are, is discharged to the collection system and the treated water is used for toilet flushing and outdoor watering. And the classic system is the Solaire building in New York City. And now every other tall building in New York City has a complete treatment system in the basement. And what's important to remember is these are called extra, uh, interception systems. All of the wastewater is intercepted before it ever reaches the collection system. And in the upper one, we have extraction. Now, the classic example of joint systems is this. Here is the Orange County Water District, Sanitation District facility. And right next door is the Orange County Water District facility. And you'll recall those very large storage tanks. Let me go back a couple of slides. These storage tanks are shown right here. And uh, why are they there? Well, they're there to equalize the flow so that you can optimize treatment. But again, here's the concept. From here, the water can be used locally. It's pumped a few miles into injection wells and into a spreading basin. And it's the co-location. And that's what's happened in the Los Angeles area. Now, instead of this, this plant actually serves as a scalping plant in that the solids are sent to the uh, lower plant down below for discharge to the ocean. But again, this represents really a kind of model for the future. And if I go back one, these two plants are co-located in Orange County, right next to each other. Here I've shown them separated because that might be the more optimal solution. But again, we need to think about them. Cola, you know, the idea is that we take this wastewater, treat it, we go through advanced wastewater treatment and we can use it locally. And that way we get multiple 
excuse me, multiple uses out of the water. So what are the take home messages from all this? I think the first one is that in the future, we proper consideration must be given to unintended consequences. For example, uh, Harold and I were talking about treatment plant designs. Well, you might not anticipate earthquakes or you might not anticipate lightning strikes or the fires that we've had in California. But I think as we move ahead, if we're gonna make these facilities resilient, you're gonna to have to think very deeply about unintended consequences. In the second issue, we've got to move beyond ideas and concepts that are no longer valid. For example, if I would pose the question to you, why do you need primary sedimentation when we have a cloth disc filter? And so we have to think about alternative configurations. The configurations that we use now for wastewater treatment are 100 years old. There have got to be new ideas. And so I'm sure that many of you in the audience will have new ideas that will uh, bring about change. And then finally, we really have to think about a paradigm shift in how we manage water and wastewater. It really has to be managed as one entity. We have to think of it as one water. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. And now we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George. There, has, there are quite a few questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, so I'm trying to sort out and uh, uh, collate many of the common questions uh, and pose it to you. Uh, one repeatedly asked question is that uh, we talked about urban sprawl and the impact uh, of the urban sprawl and the environment. And uh, you might have visited India and Harold has also visited India. This has caused, uh, apart from all the other stresses, uh, water supply is an issue in urban, the newly developed areas. Wastewater is still to catch up uh, in these areas. So we find a lot of contamination in the water bodies, rivers, lakes getting contaminated. So what, uh, uh, suggestions do you propose? What technology do you propose for contaminated water bodies? <clears throat> Andrew, are we talking about uh, contaminated, like uh, for drinking uh, drinking water supply, or uh, to for better treatment of water going into the water bodies? Uh, the water bodies, which are already contaminated. Um, mm due to wastewater discharge? The, uh, I think in many locations, uh, the first step will be, uh, for example, you could use a cloth disc filter for, as an example, this cloth disc filter provides an effluent that is almost secondary. It still has some biological, but it removes all the solid material, which you can recover gas from. So I think that instead of thinking all about complete biological treatment, you can start by removing most of the coarse solids in the organic matter. And uh, with, with the cloth disc filter, you're removing particles down to five microns. So there's very little material left. So, and when, I mean, compared to what's now discharged, it is almost like discharging drinking water. Yeah. And do I might, uh, we might add that like, <clears throat> it's much easier to, it might be easier to keep the pollution out of the surface water in the first place. So I think that's why if we could control urban runoff, control er agricultural runoff, mm -hmm. control like wastewater discharges, remove the nutrients, like that's what we need to do. And that's also the motivation behind the Spark project uh, in part is to try to capture these nutrients upstream because the one of the major issues is nutrients from our waste stream, mostly from our urine that end up in the surface waters. And that's uh, high in nutrient content, which uh, causes algae to grow and much uh, pollution to happen. And 
uh, then we get uh, damaged these aquatic ecosystems because of the nutrients. So one option is to go upstream and try to capture these nutrients and recycle them rather than let them go off into the, the lakes. Yeah, and we also get valuable fertilizer. Mm. Indu, I mean, what it really points out is that we need new thinking. We need new thinking on this subject. We cannot go back and apply the same sort of technologies that we did in the past. And uh, no idea is, is too outrageous. I mean, we just have to think of everything in, in terms of how to deal with this. And then you couple this with the intensity of rainfall events and that further complicates the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. I think some of the ideas which you have suggested are uh, not yet implemented in India. I've not seen cloth filters in many treatment plants. Uh, I, I've seen a successful operation well, in your... Indu, the, the important thing is uh, to be exposed to the ideas. In other words, if, if you've never seen a cloth disc filter, you can't imagine it. You know, that you can take wastewater and remove it down to five microns. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but yeah. it's out yeah. there and it's real. One question regarding that was uh, uh, from Ganesh Kumar from LNT, which is a very large uh, uh, construction company which builds wastewater treatment plants. He, he was asking, he's asking whether pre treatment is required to provide cloth disc filters. Is there any pretreatment for the cloth disc filter? Oh, the, the only pretreatment for the cloth disc filter is a coarse screening so that you, you remove uh, uh, large particles. Uh, another interesting thing about the cloth disc filter is that because you're removing particles down to five microns, you don't get grit accumulation in the biological treatment process. Now, unfortunately, it does accrue in the digestion process, but uh, essentially we just use a coarse screen uh, and there are a variety. I mean, stainless steel screens, a variety, but again, it's an added benefit. And one other benefit that we're seeing from the cloth disc filter is that we remove about 50% of the emulsified oil. Hmm. Yeah, it's very ideal uh, to put it up front you know, in restaurants and other places. Okay, uh, some of the questions uh, I, I'm trying to collate the repeated ones are uh, the satellite systems, what you had suggested are very novel. Uh, we do have in Chennai uh, a treatment systems, tertiary treatment systems. Chennai Metro Water is already implementing these advanced treatment systems, what you had suggested, RO, and then it is sent off to industries for use. Uh, but I really like the idea of the satellite systems where you can intercept the sewer at any point of uh, use where there is a need for water, put a treatment plant and then take it then rather than taking it all the way to the downstream. So I think that that's something a uh, take home message for our uh, municipal water uh, treatment uh, uh, bodies here who are listening to this talk. Um, and also, uh, I would like to ask you a few others have asked about direct and indirect portable reuse. Uh, we always try to uh, treat the water and take it for reuse rather than putting it down into the ground water for infiltration uh, or a surface water. So uh, can you talk about the implications of this? If, because there's always a concern that we might pollute the ground water. Even if we are going uh, to... Well, uh... Certainly, without advanced wastewater treatment, uh, the potential for polluting the groundwater is great. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with conventional treatment and, again, effluent filtration with a cloth filter, uh, if the plant is operated at a constant flow rate, you have really spectacular performance. One of the... I, 
perhaps in another lecture, we can talk about the impacts of flow equalization and variable flow rates. But what happens is that the Tillman plant in Los Angeles and the treatment plant in San Diego are operated at a constant flow rate. And when you operate at a constant flow rate, all the kinetic expressions that we use in the textbooks apply. And you get very different performance when you have variable flows and then you have return flows that complicate this, the, you deteriorate performance. And if you had a satellite plant with uh, operated at a constant flow with effluent filtration, you could in fact recharge that water using soil aquifer treatment. Yeah, but uh, the treatment what you suggested is all the way up to RO before we re-inject it into the groundwater, right? But well, RO... uh, yeah, the 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 RO. I mean, that's that's uh, very uh, ideal. I mean, in, in other words, if I had a choice, I, I would RO the water. But uh, I'm saying that uh, in, for example, in Arizona and other locations they used spreading basins to take advantage of soil aquifer treatment as, as a providing an additional polish step. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you have very high TDS water, uh, RO uh, would be appropriate to reduce it down at least to the concentration of the groundwater so that you're not increasing the TDS. Okay. I think some of our early uh, groundwater recharge projects, like maybe in the 1950s, uh, were recharging with secondary effluent, and there are cases of groundwater contamination legacy from those old recharge projects. So you're correct that the treatment uh, does need to be uh, enough sufficient so that we don't get groundwater contamination. And, and as George said, uh, salts are a major issue because uh, we don't have any good way to remove salt besides reverse osmosis uh, at the moment. Indu, let me give you another example from Orange County that's very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of concern now about PFAHs, a, an organic compound that's found in effluent. All right, so Orange County goes through advanced treatment and removes everything. But in some of the wells that they pump out, they're finding concentrations above the 10 microgram per liter level. And you ask yourself, how is this possible? Well, it's possible because we recharged river water for 50 years without advanced treatment. And so as a consequence, we have legacy pollution in the groundwater as Harold was mentioning. And so, uh, every situation is almost different. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think one last question um, is about how cost effective are these nutrient recovery systems, what was mentioned by Harold? Hmm. <clears throat> that is a, uh, exactly why we're doing this uh, SPARK project, is because there's uh, some unknowns regarding the cost of nutrient recovery. Um, so at the moment, we're developing and implementing some demonstration projects showing how we can recover nutrients. And then we're taking these recovered fertilizers and, uh, and putting those on the market to see what the market value is. And through this process, we're actually working on the economics uh, right now. But um, one project we have where we're extracting ammonia from uh, anaerobic digester that's processing food waste is uh, looks like it, the project would pay for itself in uh, two years. So I think those are the types of payback periods we're looking at for large scale projects. Okay, thank you. So uh, another repeated question, I think uh, I'll ask the organizers to give us a couple of minutes. Repeated question uh, is about the emerging pollutants like personal care products and other antibiotics and pharma residues in the water. So. Uh, how are we going to deal with all this uh, without an RO? Because RO is always expensive and we can't afford it uh, for wastewater treatment. So is there alternatives, particularly if we are going to reuse the water, 
for gardening or groundwater recharge this is a big concern uh in do the, there are now biological processes that are operated as side stream processes that produce organisms to process almost anything and it's a whole new in other words in the past we always thought of activated sludge as a single reactor mm -hmm. and but now think about activated sludge with two side reactors that are producing microorganisms to process specific compounds and that's how we have to think about biological treatment in the future you can't just think about activated sludge which is what we've done in the past how can we operate and then if we operate it at constant flow we can optimize the performance of a given set of organisms if you operate it at variable flow up and down it's very almost impossible to manage and so what we're finding is that this constant flow operation and side stream treatment open up whole new vistas and uh, another uh, technology that's out there is bio augmentation and again look historically we said all the bugs we need are in wastewater but with bio augmentation you can bio augment for specific compounds if those are important so i think it's a whole new world yeah, you know right. and, and that's yeah. why you and your students are going to solve this problem <laughs> yeah. i think a lot of challenging chemicals are being put out there like and we are well uh, you know i mean there there are so many other uh, there are so many other mm -hmm. ideas that we didn't have a chance George, Perhaps you just mentioned like uh, the idea of source control and going upstream and like why accept the... Yeah, I'll let you. Uh, uh, perhaps we can have another seminar and we can get into more technical details on some of these other processes and other yeah. other techniques. Harold has yeah. a comment. Just uh, one thing to do is, you know, we spend a lot of time in the past, I think we were focused on treating whatever comes down the pipe, you know, whatever arrives at the wastewater treatment plant is our responsibility to treat, but really we all have to take responsibility about what's going down our drains and what products we're using. So if we're using toxic compounds, like why would that go down the drain into our water supply? So that's, I think gets back to this one water approach, like all the water is uh, uh, the same. It all goes to the same place and comes from the same place. So we should treat it properly. And we need to take responsibility about not putting toxic things down the drain or constituents that can't be removed that end up in our environment. Like those, mm -hmm. we need to take responsibility upstream and take those out of the wastewater. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of eco-friendly products are out there. So probably uh, start switching. Did you, did you announce that the slides are available for everyone to take? Yes, uh, I can do it again orally. All the slides will be posted in the Siddhi website. And I'll try to get as much answers as possible for the rest of the questions uh, which are out there uh, and probably send it to you. Thank you very much for joining. We're running out of time now. The organizers have given me the cue. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> George. Uh, thank you, Harold. My, it, was, it was my pleasure and we'll look forward to the next time. Definitely. We need more such webinars. Thank you <laughs> to the audience also for joining us. I over to the organizers. Um, Sudarshan, um, so let me quickly, I, I just wanted to say, Professor Jai, um, the number of questions have uh, gone to 70. Uh, that tells you the kind of uh, excitement there is for uh, this seminar. And, and I, I, one thing I just wanted to point out, I think it, um, with this COVID, I think we have had this unprecedented opportunity to get people like you to talk to a whole section of uh, audience which would otherwise have not listened to such wonderful ideas and such experience. So I really uh, want to, I just wanted to say that I know in all problems there is uh, some silver lining looks like. So uh, thank you so much. Sudarshan, over to you. My you. pleasure. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, I would really like to thank Professor George and Professor Harold for making it uh, today. And uh, I think our participants, as uh, Raghu was mentioning, 
uh, you know we've been running this uh, series for quite a while now but uh, today was i think the most attended of the webinars and the most participative one uh, too many questions and uh, i think the goal here is that we would have these questions answered offline too so we want to encourage further discussion through the website and we don't want to stop it uh, with uh, just being a webinar and a, a one hour discussion but you know slowly uh, anyway this is of course a spark project so it goes without saying but uh, you know to uh, further engage a little more with the public in terms of say possible internships and the possible project ideas discussions uh, discussions with policy makers and uh, all of those things so i think you know we want to take this is uh, but the you know first stepping stone to this whole uh, uh, the thing oya oh, sidhi yeah, so i'd really like to thank uh, you know i think uh, uh, professor george might uh, go down as our older speaker but i think he is one of our most energetic and you know <laughs> i think as uh, many people academic at his age you know uh, oozing with energy so it's uh, great to see that especially for our uh, uh, young folks so thank you again so much for joining and uh, we are glad that we gave you an opportunity to wear a tie today and uh, with that let me close and hope to you know have you again uh, sometime soon as you've been uh, mentioning and um, i'd like to also remind people that we have uh, uh, the fourth of our um, Uh, webinars tomorrow so those of you who have a lot of questions today you can come back tomorrow and ask uh, uh, similar questions right but uh, that's a different challenge uh, it's it's going to go and look at uh, villages and uh, uh, from our own uh, you know really eminent uh, professors uh, professor liji philip and professor bs murthy so i look forward to having um, most of you back tomorrow for the webinar um, i thank you all thank and wish you a good evening thanks professor thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you Bye, everyone. Thank you.